back down at Waverly Lake. I wanted to uh, talk about drugs and uh, all the uh, things involved because it's kind of the drug culture is uh, has been a real uh, one of the real pushers in determining uh, why I had to do a lot of things in my life and and why others have been victimized and hurt and it's been an ongoing struggle and fight uh, in every country and um It's it's terrible. Uh, it, but uh, the drug culture of Beverly Hills and Hollywood, um, and the, the hippie movement and all that stuff that when it started coming out, ha- coming around, um, really, uh, it's really just is is way was way out of hand in the eighties, in the nineties. And um, it was changing a little in the 2000s. And then uh, now we just kind of at a, a point where things need to be uh, toned down. They've been toning down a little, but uh, not, I mean, people are still just terribly on high on drugs all and, and addicted. And we well, got marijuana. Now legalized, but I just want to talk to talk about it and um, share it just to make kind of a my own notes because it is why I've chose to do things a different way. It's not the only reason. Um, there's other things, uh, including witchcraft and uh, how how it's gotten so popular and and. Uh, Changed culture and attitudes and what community is about and what goes on in families and how people behave and um, what people believe about politics and, and, and law and everything, justice. And um, so... One thing about it, drugs, is what I remember, not one thing, there's so much about drugs. The the drugs that uh, were coming to a lot of the country were coming from LA and Hollywood and down in those areas and of course we know it comes from Mexico but Hollywood seemed to be like the drug pusher you know Beverly Hills rich people I remember growing up in the 70s there was like kids in the neighborhood smoking pot and I'd be like I'm never gonna smoke pot you know and then uh, other kids in the neighborhood, like the older kids, I would be like, you know, six or seven, eight. And then the older kids, they're like hanging out at each other's house, working on their muscle cars. It's the seventies, you know, and like, and they uh, they get around and smoke pot, you know, you can smell it. When I was a little kid, I had one neighbor, and um, he'd always ask me to come over and help, reaching down. And he he liked to work on cars, and he I had small arms, so he Eddie, hey, come here. And then he'd uh, see if you can get your hand in there. It'd be like a tight spot or something. And get that bolt I just dropped in there. And so I would 
you know, I'd go over there once in a while. And one time I remember there was like a whole bunch of the neighborhood high schoolers there. And he goes, I, he had me get a bowl. And then he goes, hey, come here, do me one more favor. And they grabbed us water bong that smoked pot in. And um, he goes, go fill this up with water. And I spilled some, like the water, there was a little bit of water left and it spilled out on me. I tipped it up or something and uh, it got on my pants and I smelt like pot. And I had to go home. I went home and mom goes, have you, why do you smell like pot, you know? Oh, I was talking into my phone. <clears throat> like, why do you smell like pot? And I said, I said, oh. I said, mom, I, I filled up a bong. And then she's like, well, you don't go over there anymore. I don't know what you're doing. But, but the high schooler, he was pretty nice. He'd come over and mow, mow my mom's lawn for her. And, or at least like a strip of it like the, the the sidewalk strip or whatever and he's mowing his lawn sometimes and he liked my aunt so he'd come over he'd be dating her so he kind of got away with it he, he had a pot plants growing in his backyard but all the all the people's parents now this is a catch all the parents were trying they all blamed each other's kids for getting their kids on pot to smoke pot. Oh, I know. It's that, it's that guy, it's that Brian guy. Or, it's, he's, he's why all our kids are smoking pot. Or they would say, like, and then the, the other person's kid is like, no, that is your kid. Your kid's why. And they kind of, like, would be at odds with you. They weren't, like, really, you know, close neighbors because they were, like, their kids all got on, like, derelict on them and, they're all trying to figure out whose kids to blame because they're sure it was somebody else's kid that got, that, that was influenced their kid to do it. So their their kids were, were innocent. It was the other people's kids that did it. They're, every household did that. So no one else, no one was, you know, accepting the blame. Their own kids were, were being derelict and smoking pot. And they're sure they raised their kids right. And it was, uh, was kind of stupid. So nobody is supposed to go because they had to separate their kids. And then, like, they were like, okay, well, you know, nobody was supposed to go. This kid was supposed to go over that kid's house, this kid anymore, this, that, because their kids would get out playing and get in trouble. And then the next generation, the same thing was happening. And it, it you know, it, there was just no end to it. What, how derelict everybody's kids were. They couldn't explain it. But it's just, that it wasn't like really bad like now. I mean, then it, you know they, they get out, they get a hold of some pot, you know. And there was kids who go, you know, once you know they get high school age or get out of high school age, who could get a hold of other drugs and you know would try it. But it wasn't as common as it is today. It, and and um, you know it's just kid, they would go out and get drunk or they they smoke pot, which is just. That was what was happening. The kids were getting derelict. And, um, you know, they'd see rock and rollers on TV. And um, then the 80s hit. And it, then it was really bad. That's when it was like, that's when drug war hit. And I, I don't know how much, how terrible. I mean, my, my in the 80s, my, my uncle, who was a Vietnam War vet, he shot himself, committed suicide, high on meth and depressed and stuff. And, and um, my other uncle, he was homeless and he was a Vietnam vet and had been attached to a Green Beret unit as a, com a comms guy, communications. It wasn't Green Beret, but he was attached to him for two tours in Vietnam. And he ended up like committing murder over drug deals and their whole unit was dealing drugs. And um, then when he got out, he had a real bad drug problem. He was like using heroin when he was over there. And, but then he came, my, he got homeless. My parents helped him and he lived with me in the eighties. He lived with us in our house and he was dealing drugs to kids in the park. <laughs> and um, 
I don't know. It was really weird. And I was like really popular kid. I, I was a dance DJ, school photographer, class council for three years, um, dance committee, um, played every, tried every sport at least once, you know, I was made varsity teams and stuff like that. I was an undefeated school wrestler for two seasons and presidential fit. I was really popular, knew a lot of kids. And I was in the Cub Scouts, Boy Scouts, and um, I, don't, I don't know. It was uh, when I found out my uncle got was dealing drugs in the park. Uh, my my friend told me. I I just decided not to tell anybody. You know, I didn't tell my parents or anything else. I thought, you know. Nobody, nobody to know just because the kids that he was selling drugs to were just like these derelict drug druggies to me and I was like well maybe maybe nobody know if I don't say anything <laughs> <You know? laughs> and then um, so I didn't want to you know go through it how the big deal I I didn't you know I kind of liked him you know? it's, I mean, make anything situation worse I don't know what to do about it you know and he didn't have any job, but he was good at work. And um, he had made my parents this coffee table. And it was like really nice, handmade coffee table. So he was good at woodworking, and I guess he knew, you know, he had quite a few of skills. And of course, my grandfather, by marriage, that um, it was his father um, who had adopted him. Actually, he was adopted, my uncle, this uncle. And um, so he was a diesel mechanic, my gran that grandfather, my mother's stepfather. And um, he had been a war vet and he worked in the shop all the time, kind of a homesteader because he had seven kids. They had like a little homestead so they could feed them all. And um, It was a. Uh, what are those? I don't know. It was one of those strange, hard situations to go through. And I was learning and growing up, learning to do the drug war hit, you know, with Ronald Reagan. And, and then uh, I got tempted him to, to use pot myself. And I had. Uh, Kids that I was in Cub Scouts with, you know, come come up to me. Hey, you want to try this stuff, you know? And they had been my friends, you know, since I was a child. We'd go on campouts just about every weekend in the summers and stuff. Even in the winters, we'd go camping in the snow, go up to a Boy Scout cabin. We had uh, my one of my friends knew his father knew the Cubs, one of the Boy Scout masters, and some troop that had a cabin on uh, this really nice creek called Eagle Eagle Creek. And it had where a lot of salmon and uh, steelhead come up, come up the river there. And you can see him try to go up waterfalls and stuff. And the cabin was right there on the river. And uh, we'd go on weekends and we'd have, uh, we'd have like, we'd play this game where you, go hide in the woods and one person has a lantern and has to find the other person, find somebody and hide and seek with lanterns, you know. And then, of course, the same way. It's just hide and seek in the woods with a lantern. And, uh, go fishing. Like in the winter time, I remember we'd be like laugh at each other because we'd be getting hypothermia and watching each other shake and trying to get a fire started and stuff. But, and then the drugs started hitting and all that stuff started changing. We stopped going to the Boy Scout cabin and his kids were on dope. And then by high school, it was getting real serious because um, there were most of, I could I didn't, I only knew a few respectable like track guys and all the other jocks, they're just they're cocaine, whatever else kind of drug. And 
you know, they're raping girls, they're getting, uh, it, it's, it's just, um, you know, there's, there's deaths and stuff and kids getting drunk and high and driving, drunk driving, and rapes, guys abusing people, and guys trying to look like these heavy metal rock and rollers, growing their hair out long over the summer, and pretending they're star, rock stars, and getting all the drugs. I remember these two kids, they uh, stole these two guys, hung out together, and they stole uh, whiskey, Jim Bean whiskey, a box of it, a case of it. Um, it was some liquor store set it out behind the store and it hadn't been put inside yet and they found it kids just took it you know and and they were drunk just about every time I I, I just I can't like I don't know I, I just I just know I just wonder now how much of an alcoholic they are it just they, they were you know they started that's how they started drinking they found some whiskey and it was a whole case so they decided they're just gonna drink it all you know <clears throat> and um So, I don't know, just every every person had their thing, but it was happening all over. Like my one friend, he had like kidney problems and his father was a, a government architect and his parents got divorced and plus he had kidney problems and real bad health. And so he started smoking, stre- deal with the stress and then he started smoking the pot. And, you know, and he's like, hey, you know, no, hey, this is, you like it, man. You know, smoking cigarettes. It, it, we would go swimming. I'm doing this happen. We were a swimming pool. I, we used to go swimming all the time. It's a public swimming pool at the high school. Uh, I was on a water polo team um, for one seat. Well, I dropped the season because I just was too much swimming. I didn't like to be in the water that long. But <clears throat> too much swimming. I like to go swimming, but not enough to be a, on water polo all the time. We did like a 24 hour swimathon and then I quit because that was like too much water. <clears throat> um, I don't know. It was, uh, gotten getting worse and worse in my family. And then, then I, I lived next door to these people and there was like this murder over this cocaine deal that wasn't, it wasn't real cocaine. It was like somebody got deal penicillin instead of cocaine and there's I lived around hunters and vets and somebody ended up killing somebody for money who was a kid teen and then um, he was poor didn't have any money so he's going to do it I don't think he was really on I don't remember ever being on any kind of drug other than just like I don't think he had enough money to buy drugs. He was, and then I lived next door to a, a green, uh, not well. Nick, I lived next door to a Green Bray son, and he was like friends with the hunter safety instructor's son. And then there was uh, like this coke dealer's son across the way in another apartment for six months I lived in these apartments because my parents got divorced and they were like right by my dad had like a, a five bedroom house and but down the street on the end of the street of course were the apartments and when he got divorced he you know she got the furniture and this and that and like that he thought well you know instead of moving too far away he just moved to those apartments and until he could uh save up money and find something else to do because he had lost his job that was paying for the five bedroom house and he had some from accidents falling off the roof he was a roofer had two crews but it all went you know it was just bad. It was like a war. And then I remember like, like there were survivalists. We went up to this lake, there's like survivalist training because uh, there was a nuclear war threat during waking time, you know? And we went up to this lake and there's guys shooting machine guns and stuff, uh, survivalist training. Deer Lake, I think it was called or something up by Mount Hood, Oregon. And so we're like, 
going through my this one kid, the one neighbor's father's uh, Green Beret manual, uh, how to survive a super uh, nuclear war. You know, all about nuclear warheads and their blasts and how to build a bomb shelter, all that stuff. And then um, I, uh, my other neighbor now, he's like this German guy. Grew up on his father was a drill sergeant, and he grew up on a. Um, on a German military base and they uh, he like showed me he took like the tip of a pen and he had some cocaine that he cooked it and like mixed it with baking soda or whatever I don't remember how and, and he was gonna smoke it in a pipe and he goes, no, don't ever do this. Uh, okay. He's like 22 and I'm like 14. And uh, I don't want, you know, you know I'm, I'm going to show you this little bit, you know. <laughs> and uh, he took this, a pen and took the tip of the uh, ink pen and then got this little flake to stick on the ink pen. Yeah, I, you could barely see it. And he tapped it back and he said, now this is all you need and that would kill you. And that'll probably numb you for about five minutes, numb your lips for about five minutes. And he told, you know, I, I, so I tried it. I did try this little teeny minuscule flake. flake. And um, he goes, don't hold it in your lungs, you'll die. And, uh, you know, I was like scared. And I tried it. He goes, I just want you to know what it is. But I want you also to know that you can't afford it. You don't need it. And that's what people are doing. And, and they go rob their mothers and fathers and neighbors for the money and <clears throat> blah, blah, blah. But then um, I actually did go some, you know, through a murder and all kinds of stuff. So I was like, you know, okay, I'm not, I don't want to round anybody on this stuff, you know. And um, then my friend that I'd gone to Cub Scouts with, who would try to turn me on, you know, pot and all that stuff. Um, he told me that he see his father owned a storage unit and uh, was self-employed and he, there was another kid his father owned a gas station in town and the gas station was doing pretty good and his father was doing pretty good and moved up to Lake Oswego where the rich people live and um, you know got a do and um I think he had probably opened some other businesses and was doing pretty good. And um, so my one friend, he would go visit him. To, you know, their father's both self-employed and stuff. Uh, and um, in the Lake Oswego, and he said that the rich people's kids had every kind of drug and that they were giving him cocaine, they gave him PCP, got high on PCP, said, he was hallucinating about his head rolling down the street when he was driving down the street and riding in a car with somebody. And he said, you know, he said the walls were breathing and turned had faces and all kinds of weird hallucinations. And I was like, oh my God, that was freaking me out. I was like, oh, I don't want that to happen to me. You know? So I, I don't know. I just kind of learned from, you know how you learn from other people's mistakes? So, oh my God, whatever that, that guy did just... That, that this happened or that happened I just don't let me do it God you know <laughs> kind of um, so you you know of course I learned from my own mistakes also but uh, a lot of things I was able to escape that others had done you know at least consider it took it serious enough that I didn't take it as lightly as some others you know like some of those sports players people that were thinking I, I stopped sports eventually after I had moved from high school, like four high schools. and I just didn't like joining up on different teams anymore because I was going from high school to high school. You know, you couldn't like stay on one high school and just compete with, go to the next high school, then you go to the next high school. And then uh, you never win, even no matter how good you are, if as long as, because it's a team sport and like the teams always lose. And I don't know, it was really sucks. I didn't like it. And um, I was an outdoorsman and so, it's like that wasn't the only activities I do, and um, I always found it, you know, something to do. 
boy, I'm out here at the lake today, and there, there's uh, people catching fish left and right. I see him on the dock over there, and then this guy just caught two. Second one in like 10 minutes. I see a fish jump, something. Kind of nice, though. But I, I just, uh, I don't know. You know, and then as I would go through high school, and then it started getting really bad because then, like everybody got on crank, like towards the end of the '80s. Everybody, everybody, there wasn't anybody I'd met. Maybe I mean, it just seemed like everybody, like, no matter what job I worked in, at this restaurant, I worked as a carpenter. I did everything I did. There, everybody was on drugs at work. They were a lot of people were just on. Crank, they call it. Used to call it crank. And um, everybody in the apartments I lived, they were all on crank, except for a few people that I knew I weren't. But but I knew most people were. And um, it was getting so hard to deal with. And every year that it would go by, it was getting worse and worse until the '90s hit, and it was so bad in the '90s. I mean, everybody seemed to be on crank. Except for like, you know, your real health nut or your serious Christian. Other than that, like you're just they were on something, you know. But crank was seen to be the drug of choice at the time. <laughs> and um, it was bad. They call meth, they call it now, you know. It's just crank was a different word for it. I think they used to carry it in the crank cases of bikers did of their bikes to hide it and so they called it crank but it changed the culture I mean there, people were, were behaving different and, and you kind of know I mean most people afterwards who knows kind of how it goes but it was just how avoided every job you know your manager I don't know how many jobs people got on and the managers on crank come on every, only people on drugs on the job like every retail store you had to watch out for you know trying to work on, on a job and trying to get along with people and and um, it, it was so hard with meth. Meth was the hardest. And if you didn't, even and there's, even smoking pot, if you didn't smoke pot, you know, you know, and the manager did, you know, you're going to be asked to leave because they get paranoid and they don't want him on the job. Might tell on them. And it was weird, you know. It's kind of reverse of what the employers do. The employer wants everybody drug tested, and then you got know, you got people that are on drugs because all they have to use is golden seal and it don't show up. Just not do drugs for a month or whatever they do if they're not hardcore addicts. But yeah, most of the factory workers in town they were on them, uh, heroin or meth or both, and you know, a lot of production workers. And it was pretty depressing, pretty immoral, and kind of cruddy and eerie and spooky. And it was rock and roll, you know. So. Um, now uh, we need need to work work on and they were parents that was the generation of the parents now the kids and they're my age and um, I don't even know how many have made it out I can look uh, I start my, on Facebook up some people and some seemed alright and others you know I was wondering if I should call the FBI or what you know <laughs> It's pretty bad. I think that's got some fish. Stringer. I guess they just stocked the lake or something. I think it seemed like decent size, like 12 inch trout. Um, frying pan size. So, I don't know. The drugs have been really hard to deal with. And so when I'm thinking about doing this beer garden like thing and with beer gardens and, and music and as being like house musicians that tour so they're not as free to be like Hollywood free and um, I gotta be like a house musician but I'm trying to deal with the corruption you know letting the wineries and the, and the breweries like uh, you know kind of screen the musicians as much as possible because wineries and breweries aren't as bad as like a bar 
wineries and breweries, like you go to a brewery and it's pretty chill and it's pretty normal. Um, now we got a lot of microbreweries, but like um, even they, wineries especially. I mean, you go to a winery and they're like these really elegant, nice things and places, you know. So I figured, well, but any, you know, any kind of, some, you never know. You can't judge people just by the fact that they own a winery. You don't know if they're going to let they're on drugs or what, you know? So I, there, that's just one of the risks and that's one of, but to change the culture away from, and tone it down, you know, um, race from the Hollywood rock and roll drugs, sex, drugs, rock and roll, hardcore rebellion, you know, and uh, tone it down <laughs> to just the beer garden winery thing, you know, people accepting that. And we'll see how that goes, but I have an idea. Just, Small uh, small operations or like microbrewers and wineries to partner on and um, managed by <coughs> my company and um, for tourism, you know, like everything you want to see in America, you can see just going to this place, bed and breakfast, it's affordable, these little puddle jumpers, double dual prop planes instead of litter jets, you know. <laughs> Yeah, be cool, but that the drugs. I just want to talk about it. You know, I mean, it, it gets pretty bad, and um, with everybody on them, like nobody wants anybody to do anything about it because, of course, people are like groupthink and birds of feather flock together. You know, there's kind of a moral to it that's that's really. You know, and we had enemies. And I don't know how much of. Russia, what Russia was doing with the atheists. I mean, Putin's not an atheist, but um, why there was atheists, they did everything they can. I don't know how, a lot of California probably had to do with uh, the communists, you know. Um, the KGB, that, it, they would take like, there's a small moral thing and people do, you know, that kind of messes with people's minds and they would magnify that. You know, they say, hey, this might work. We'll see. They would want to mess people's countries up with it. Like, something like, you know, some kind of guru teacher or something. They would, like, get that guru teacher to, ha you know, help him get a whole bunch of students. So if, if they knew it, he was really messing people's heads up, you know. Um, so a lot of this stuff that it goes on in our country, I just wonder how much is our, our enemies in the East, you know. But... And the hippie movement, they magnified the hippie movement, they, the communists, and they did a lot of things. It, it, it's really bad, so I think the drug culture has a lot to do with them. You know how they you always notice Russia goes down to, like, Colombia or places where they deal the drugs. And over the Middle East, you know, where they deal the dope and be there. He's their friend. The, their, their Russian president's always their friend, you know. But I don't know. We don't know. I just uh, want to talk about it a little bit. I just like, can't, don't have the great thing to say about it. I just want to talk about it.